Anyone who knows me in real life has likely heard me go on and on about how much I love Twin Peaks. Despite the show being a weird fever dream of murder, horror, melodrama, and very suspicious behavior around coffee. <coughs> Damn good coffee. And hot. Twin Peaks is a piece of comfort media for me that I find myself returning to maybe once a year. I love the characters, the music, the dreamlike narrative, the beautiful memes. Have you ever had a dream that for three seasons, or more like two and a half seasons, because season two is rough, Twin Peaks was one of the most groundbreaking pieces of narrative fiction ever to grace the small screen. It fundamentally transformed the way that I and many viewed narrative storytelling, particularly because it found a tone that was both familiar and alien on television. It was dark, unsettling, but also quirky, warm, and obsessed with cherry pie. Would you like some pie? Massive, massive quantities and a glass of water, sweetheart, my socks are on fire. But nestled in between season two and three of the show is a prequel film that's not comfy? Like at all? <laughs> Twin Peaks Fire Walk With Me is a disturbing, brutal, chilling work of horror that never ceases to pulverize me every time I revisit it. It's so uncompromising in its twisted vision that it really alienated audiences upon release and received such glowing critical praise as... Bruh. And while these types of vitriolic reactions are less common now, I still come across folks who are repelled by Firewalk with me, despite liking or even loving the TV series. And, um... I think this might be my favorite or second favorite David Lynch movie? What the hell? I think its bold vision presents us with one of the most empathetic and realistic depictions of mental illness across American cinema. I don't know how popular of an opinion that is, because as previously mentioned, Fire Walk With Me is maybe David Lynch's most prickly and abjectly horrifying movie. And like, this is coming from the guy who made this. Mommy. Mommy loves you. Baby wants to- Stay inside and bake cookies with you. But I also wonder if my specific love for Fire Walk With Me is shared by people who like the film and appreciate what it's doing on a thematic level. Much of the positive criticism surrounding this film has cited Lynch's on-record love for Laura Palmer as the reason why it works emotionally. And while I won't dare dispute that love, have we maybe considered... The possibility that love is not enough. My love for this movie is also enabled by an appreciation for Laura Palmer and the complex portrait of her that Lynch co-writer Robert Engels and actress Cheryl Lee present us with. But I think that love may be too general of a word. Instead, I want to propose that I connect with Laura more than I love her. I see aspects of her character that are relatable to my own emotions and, I believe, reflect the experiences and struggles of folks who may be experiencing similar pain to her. There are plenty of other worthwhile and fascinating discussions of Laura as a character within popular discourse, but they are understandably and often rightly couched within broader discussions of the film as a work of meta-commentary. While that discourse is worth checking out, my primary goal here is to shift focus away from broader discussions of what Fire Walk With Me is on an intertextual level, and towards the much smaller question of, well, who is Laura Palmer exactly? What are the bits of character development and internal conflict that define her, and why is it that they ring so true to me well over 30 years after Fire Walk With Me's initial release? So join me as we peel back the curtains, open up our diaries, wheel our meals. Is, is, is that a thing? Is, is that a thing? And answer the question, who is Laura Palmer? So, Laura Palmer. Homecoming queen at Twin Peaks High, best friends with the very sweet Donna Hayward, secretly dating the equally sweet James Hurley, and dating everyone's favorite bad boy, Bobby Briggs. <laughs> Despite the facade of the archetypal teenage life, Laura is caught in a tragic downward spiral that the audience, and arguably she herself, knows will eventually lead to her death. Quit trying to hold on so tight. I'm gone. 
under the brutal hand of her father, possessed by an evil entity named Bob, Laura routinely suffers from sexual and psychological abuse. Those abuses have enabled Laura to fall into a life of drugs, reckless partying, teenage sex work, and constant harassment from an insidious supernatural world. And through this narrative, we bear witness to Laura's deeply conflicted emotional and mental headspace during these events. If I were to define that conflict, it would be between self-destructive nihilism and, tragically, a desire to have that nihilism be proven wrong. Okay, so nihilism. Big word. Niles. <laughs> The Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy broadly defines nihilism as the belief that all values are baseless and that nothing can be known or communicated, and that the philosophy is often associated with extreme pessimism and a radical skepticism that condemns existence. Now, it's worth noting that an embrace of nihilism can be a liberating thing for many, but that's not what Laura's struggling with here. Laura's constant endurance of abuse has left her dejected and with a deeply cynical outlook towards the supposedly meaningful pillars of what girls her age are supposed to find meaning in. At least in a patriarchal hegemony like the American suburbs, which Twin Peaks pointedly criticizes. Mother, I like Jeff a lot. Well, I know this. I like him too. Oh, I don't know. I'd rather go out with Jeff, but I wish the others wouldn't ignore me so. James is the one. He loves you with that everlasting love. Yes, James is very sweet. Why don't you get out your violin, Donna? Her biggest crisis of faith, though, exists within the confines of the home, where her supposed safe haven has been utterly corrupted by the long-standing abuses that she has endured by Bob and her father. In Maggie Mae Fish's excellent video about Twin Peaks and all its spin-offs, she describes both Laura's trauma in the home and its broader societal significance by saying, I can't stress enough how much of a deviation this was from the cultural narrative in America during the 80s, when the public was very much wrapped in the stranger danger panic, even though in reality, the majority of abuse happened within the home. For Laura, there is nothing safe or sacred about home. Take a look at this horrific scene where the ritual of a family dinner is turned into an abject nightmare as her father exerts pointless control over her and her mother. Oh, these hands are filthy. Lynn, what are you doing? Look at this finger here. Did Bobby give you this? Or is there someone new? Leave her alone. Don't do that. She doesn't like them. How do you know what she likes? Stop it! <laughs> And I think the most explicit expression of Laura's overall nihilistic outlook can be seen in this scene, where her and Donna speak about falling through space. Do you think that if you were falling in space, that you would slow down after a while or go faster and faster? Faster and faster. For a long time, you wouldn't feel anything. But then you'd burst into fire. And the angels wouldn't help you, because they've all gone away. I think what I find most tragic about this moment is that we completely understand where Laura's coming from, but we also see somewhere Laura wants to be wrong about this. Much of Laura's actual arc in Fire Walk With Me comes from her quest to find out exactly who Bob is. And what's most tough about this is that she's given the answer to that question pretty definitively early on in the narrative. No, 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 no. Now this moment leaves very little room for doubt that Bob and Leland are the same person. But she nevertheless spends so much of this movie trying to find an answer that undoes what she saw. Dad? Yes. Did you come home during the day last week? I thought I saw you. God, you know, I did stop home on Friday, come to think of it. I had this severe headache. For as much as Laura knows how perverted and corrupted the world she lives in is, she also desperately wants to be wrong about her dad being the one chiefly responsible for her suffering. Look at this moment here where Laura looks up to the angels above her desk. Sick. 
these are figures who she said will never save her, and yet she begs. So to cope, Laura destroys herself. She spends much of the movie either actively hurting herself through substance abuse or putting herself in situations that are dominated by physically and sexually abusive men, hurtling herself closer and closer to the death that we all know is inevitable. It's also worth asking to what degree Laura uses her self-destruction as a way to take down the town's sacred pillars that she knows to be bullshit. When Laura goes to the roadhouse and asks a group of men, so you want I'm reminded of a quote from Nietzsche's Will to Power where he writes, everything deserves to perish, but one actually puts shoulder to the plow, one destroys. But this exhortation of power isn't some girl boss friendly display of superiority over the men in her life. Quite the contrary, it's a reaction to just how utterly powerless she finds herself under the hands of her abusers. Throughout Fire Walk With Me, we see Laura's power and agency constantly undermined. Be it through finding a page of her diary ripped out against her will by Bob, the previously mentioned dinner table scene, the way that that ring of death is forced into her hand by the arm, and of course the ending, which I'm not going to get into, but it's rough. And that's where we find Laura in Fire Walk With Me. She's self-destructive, dejected, taking the reins of her own death, and hopelessly nihilistic. Nevertheless, she's fighting for any kind of hint that she may be wrong enough to find some kind of light in this empty, painful world. In other words, it's me. Hi. Okay, okay, I, I know that that phrase is a bit of a joke, but I don't think it's controversial to say that we're living in the midst of a depression epidemic. Be it through the seemingly increasingly hostile conditions of the current global climate, you, you could take that literally if you want, or through broader understandings of mental health entering popular vocabulary and putting words to feelings that people have been either repressing or finding difficulty communicating for years. And while the Canadian Centre for Addiction and Mental Health, I'm Canadian, I, I'm, I'm using their data, has reported the terrifying statistic that one in two Canadians by the age of 40 either will or currently are experiencing mental illness in their lifetime. Also worth noting is that 39% of high school students in my native Ontario indicate moderate to severe levels of psychological distress. You know, people Laura's age. I bring this all up because I want to stress how important it is that we have accurate depictions of mental anguish and emotional distress on screen. It's important that those who are suffering through a mental health crisis get to see their struggles depicted realistically. And some of that identification is bad. When you cross a mentally ill loner with a society. Fire Walk With Me has been compared to Andrew Dominic's atrocity exhibition, Blonde. That film in particular really grinds my gears because its depiction of Norma Jean, AKA Marilyn Monroe, seems hell-bent on robbing this character of any sort of agency, like, at all. We understand that she's suffering conditions that, like Laura's, are indisputably real and punishing. However, unlike Laura, who spends the movie either fighting for some answer, reprieve, or taking the reins of her own destruction, Norma really wants a baby. You're not the same baby. You're this baby. That was me. It's always me. I also want to highlight Florian Zeller's The Sun, a film that has gotten fairly lukewarm reviews, <laughs> and whose understanding of mental illness is that it just happens. Like, the film has no interest in exploring any traumas fundamental to its central character, and instead treats being depressed like catching a cold that sometimes just won't go away. And Joker, a film about a seriously unwell individual whose liberation comes from not taking his meds and railing against society. Now, I'm a male identifying guy with my own experiences, which means some of the patriarchal abuse explored in stuff like Fire Walk With Me and Blonde are not necessarily reflective of my own experiences. However, I have experienced levels of depression and mental anguish that enable a great deal of identification with me with characters like this. I've gone through my fair share of depressive episodes in my day. I've been in and out of therapy for like seven or eight years now, and I've, I've abused a substance or two as a result of depression. Smoke weed every day. 
In other words, seeing characters who are going through it depicted well means a lot to me, and that's something that I kind of realized over the course of making this essay. In Laura, I see someone whose entire world is colored by depression, clawing to prove that maybe that the world isn't as hopeless and awful as it seems. And in Fire Walk With Me, at least for a while, it seems that Laura will never get that. She finds irrefutable evidence that her father is assaulting her, so she distances herself from her friends. The world ends up dull and meaningless, and she disappears into a cloud of sex and drugs, and then she dies. And if this was how the film ended, it would be crushing, but Fire Walk With Me does something remarkable in its final minutes. Fire Walk With Me's final moments are haunting in a way that very few films have been able to replicate. After her death, Laura finds herself in the Red Room with Agent Cooper standing just above her. Laura starts to cry and looks up and sees an angel. But not just any angel, it's herself. Laura cries tears of joy in this moment. As she ascends, we linger on her tear-strewn face, finally finding peace after so very long. In an article written for The Ringer, film critic Kay Austin Collins writes, In slow motion and set to exquisite swells of music, we see Lynch give Laura not a chance at transcendence, but something closer to grace. Grace here is the important word. I suspect those who don't like this movie and are still watching this video expect me to contend with the reading that Laura's death is an act of grace predominantly because it simply frees her from her abusers, and I just don't think that's entirely what's happening here. Laura's grace, to me, comes in the realization that after spending an entire film searching for answers that will prove her father's innocence and having her worst fears and self-destructive tendencies reinforced and actualized within the narrative, Laura gets to be wrong about something else. And the angels wouldn't help you because they've all gone away. With this image, the film simultaneously finds space to mourn the loss of Laura, but also give her space to realize that though the world can be an awful place, the possibility of salvation does exist, even from within, and that said salvation is beautiful. The ending, of course, begs the question of, if Laura got to be wrong about the angels, did she get to be wrong about anything else? Are you mad at me for wearing something of yours? I don't want you to wear my stuff. One of the most salient fears Laura holds throughout Fire Walk With Me is the fear that if her friends were given too much access to her private light, that they would be corrupted or ruined like her. When the log lady tells Laura that, When this kind of fire starts, it is very hard to put out. The tender boughs of innocence burn first and the wind rises, and then all goodness is in jeopardy. It's ambiguous if the all goodness she's referring to is merely internal or not, but Laura seems to believe that her friends, Donna and James, are in very real danger through their association with her. <laughs> what? Both characters certainly do and will go through hardships, but the goodness that Laura sees in them never really goes away. It's also worth noting that the horrifying and corrupting rot that Laura identifies in so much of her life amidst so many men is not as all-consuming as it may seem to her. I don't want to be all hashtag not all men because there are certainly unambiguously vile, horrible and revolting dudes in this world, but there are also people who end up seeing the error of their ways, atone for their sins, and make the world a better place. We see this a lot in Bobby Briggs, who gets this moment in the show during Laura's funeral, which just sends me every time. Everybody knew she was in trouble, but we didn't do anything. You want to know who killed Laura? You did! We all did. His relationship with Shelley also stands in pretty sharp contrast to his relationship with Laura, and later in life, we see just how much he cares about his former high school sweetheart. Poor Palmer. <laughs> I 
It is deeply tragic that Laura never got to realize that her depressed worldview could be proven wrong until after her death. But she got to be wrong regardless. She got to spend the last moments in the waiting room between life and death realizing that there is good in this horrible world, and that said good is beautiful. And I hope that if you see yourself in Laura's pain, that that absolution comes earlier to you than it did to her. Fire Walk With Me is indeed a punishing experience, but it's a profoundly felt one, made by a filmmaker who, knowingly or not, managed to craft one of the most realistic and empathetic depictions of the lowest possible emotional and mental state one could possibly undergo. And while the comparatively campy television series will always hold a place in my heart, so too will this relentless but ultimately beautiful piece of cinema that reminds me that in this horrible world, maybe the angels are still out there to help us.